Yes. All right. Father God, we just come to you right now, humbly, Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus, Lord. We are so grateful, Lord, for your Holy Spirit and for your son, Lord. We thank you for this time, Lord, we're able to spend in your word, Lord, and ask, Lord, that you would illuminate your word to us, Father God, that we may grow closer in relationship with you, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would just give my husband um, the words, Lord, and the revelation knowledge, Lord, to um, open up your word and what you have to say to us, Father. Lord, I just lift up Alicia to you, Lord, and um, her surgery that she's um, gone through today, Lord. I pray for a quick and speedy recovery, Lord. I ask, Lord, that she, um, that you would just be with her through any pain and discomfort, Lord, and you'd minimize that in Jesus' name, Lord. I pray, Lord, that any kind of infection, um, that you would just eliminate that, Lord. And ask that she would be able to get back to a hundred percent quickly. And we thank you that you are able to do that. And we know that um, you are a you are a faithful God, Lord. And Lord, I just lift up um, our other Bible study members, Lord, and um, those that um, just ask, Lord, that you would just be with each and every single one of them, Lord, tonight. I pray, Lord, that wherever they're at, Lord, that you'd bless them, Lord. Thank that you'd you. be a hedge of protection around them, Lord. Lord, I just ask that, um, that you would draw people to your word, Father God, and that this, this time, Lord, would um, honor you and uh, would bring you glory, Father. Lord, we just ask that you would be with um, our, uh, our grandchildren, our future grandchildren, our children, Lord, that you'd be a hedge of protection around them, Father God. You'd give them guidance and wisdom, Lord. Lord, I just pray over those that don't know you, Lord those who are searching, Father God, for answers, Lord, that you would continue to, to hearken unto their heart, Lord, and that you would draw them by your Holy Spirit, Father God. Lord, open up their eyes, Father God, and remove the blinders from their eyes. We thank, thank you, you Father. Father. Father, I just ask that you um, lay your arms around my son and his wife. Father, you keep their um, my grandson, baby Asher, safe. Yes. Um, he's having a going through a little something. Um, Father, I just ask that you that you touch my grandchild with your healing hands. Yes, Lord. And that whatever it is he's going through, that that not only will you make it quick, but you'll completely wipe it out, Father. You'll heal him from his head to his toes. And yes. Father, just I ask you just heal the rest of his life, that he that he live a, a life glorifying you, that whatever he does will be your hands and feet, and he'll honor you, God. And I want to thank you for my daughter, Madison, and her family and her coming child. Keep them safe, Father. And I also like to pray for, um, like Alana said, all the people out there that we don't mention, that we tend to, that we, we don't forget, but they don't necessarily just come to the tip of our tongue during prayer. But, Father, I just I ask that you bless all the people alive tonight, our government, our leaders, our churches, Father, that you'd lead and guide them in truth and understanding that religion would not get in the way that false doctrine would not get in the way that yes. the agenda of the enemy yes. using the religious realm the political and the educational systems and the gatekeepers that control the flow of information that father you don't let the enemy be the flow of information into their ears whether it's whether it's tiktok or youtube or facebook or anything like that our children or adults father that you don't use let the enemy have any airtime yes on our social media and you would advance the kingdom using uh, us, Father. And it's all about your son, Jesus. And we give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. name. Amen. All right, boo. All right. Did you hear that noise back there? Nope. It was like a, like a really deep, loud. You want to maybe check if something happened? No. But it was loud. It was pretty loud. So. We have Deborah Cole watching. Deborah Cole. Hey, Deborah. It's about to get good in here. So, Deborah, you got to hear this one. This is going to be good. I got to get charged up. Give me just a second here. A couple more sips. Be ready to go. Deborah, do you need any prayer for anything? You just, you good. Hi, thumbs up. Do you need any prayer? I mean, we already prayed, but we can close out with prayer if you need one um, here when we're done. All right. So, oh, there's a heart. Awesome. Okay, so we ended off 
um, this week we're in chapter 15, right, love? Yes, we are. Last week, uh, we've been carrying on. I, I told you guys that in John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, I think it's either around 17 or 18, there's also a prayer, but all of these are Jesus uh, is with his disciples in what's called the upper room. It's called the upper room discourse. Um, ah, mom says we need prayer for COVID. Anybody with COVID tonight? I know they were going through something on their trip. So we will pray for that as well, mom. Um, and by the way, thank you for being on. Um, so yeah, um, this started out, Jesus was with his disciples. He had stopped his public ministry around chapter 13 of John. <clears throat> and basically John chapter 13, which we're, we're going through this area, but John chapter 13, all the way to 17 before he goes to the cross is basically this conversation that Jesus has in chapter 13, what's called the last supper. Forget the cameras up here. Um, it's known as the last supper. It's the fourth discourse. Um, and here, we, by the way, we start today in John chapter 15. This is the seventh of the I am statements. And we'll get into that. I am the true vine is how it starts out. So since John chapter 13, there was this discourse where Jesus is speaking to his closest disciples. So it's no longer public ministry. He's he's talking to them privately in this uh, the dinner that he has in this triclinium that we talked about, this um, kind of N-shaped table. Um, a lot of times you see the painting, it's just a straight table that was not... Um, uh, anyway, it's another day. Um, so basically these 13, 14, 15, 16 are these chapters where Jesus is having this intimate conversation with them and he introduces the other comforter, the Holy Spirit. And basically these four to five chapters are all about the Holy Spirit, all about, um, you know, what he's going to do. He talked about heaven. He talked about this other comforter that's going to come that's not better than him, but it's going to do greater works because now the Holy Spirit will be in us and we'll be in larger numbers. And so he says, uh, it'll be greater what we do with the Holy Spirit now that there's other Christians that have basically his spirit inside of them. And so that that whole upper room discourse happened two weeks ago. And so now we're in chapter 15. So we're about halfway through that upper room discourse that it's called. Um, they've left the upper, uh, excuse me, they've left the last supper. And so Jesus, I think at the end of chapter 13, right at the end, he says, let me get this right, um, is it chapter 14? Let's keep going. At the end of chapter, yes, at the end of chapter 14 and verse 31, I'm kind of bringing you guys into this. Jesus is very intimate. It says, you know, he's having this discussion. And at the end, he says, arise, let us go hence. And that um, that's basically um, a traditional way of saying, let's go fight. Let's go fight to the death. Or he's going to go to his death. It's It's an announcement. So I would say that they they probably stood up and they started walking. Um, and so you get into chapter 15, which we're going to talk about today. And I want to kind of paint the picture of John chapter 15. It'll make it'll it'll edify us a whole lot more if we know exactly what Jesus is saying. So they've stood up, they're on this walk. And so um basically Jesus, and we're gonna read. But Jesus, he stands up after he says, arise. And in verse 15, if I can get my microphone out of my face. Um, one second. I got to get this right. Maybe this is better. I'll get it worked out. Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, so chapter 15, basically. So I'm going to go ahead and read something. Um, I'm trying to figure out where I want to start with this. Um, the well, the beginning of 15, but I want to mention that I'll just go ahead and read the first two, uh, I'll read the first two verses and I'm going to explain something that's really important. Um, he starts out by seven saying his seventh, I am, and he says in verse one of chapter 15 of John, I am the true vine. Now he's not saying I am when you think of, uh, he's telling the truth he, what the what this is referring and he does tell the truth because he is truth he's he's referring here to that i am the faithful vine and why is he saying i'm the faithful vine well here it could be a couple different things um so this is passover this is coming up this is the last couple hours of his life and so they leave this upper room and they go down through the um the kidron valley uh, over to the Mount of Olives, and they, they're basically taking this walk into um, the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus has his famous, um, you know, he, was it cries as though there were drops of blood? Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Yeah. And so he's going through this valley, and so it would be a full moon, and, and right in this area, 
there could have been there could have been grapevines, right? There could have been uh, a vineyard right there. But the more likely reason why he said I am the true vine is because if you read Flavius Josephus, um, he was a Jewish historian in the time of Jesus, and he writes about King Herod's temple that was basically right in line with where where he he would be walking with his disciples, and so they have these pillars on both sides that are made out of gold on the archway as well as the building itself and they had these grapevines these vines and so it would have been a full moon about this time so you could imagine probably a full moon was like set across you know like probably illuminating these vines and this was the entryway to the temple and during passover the temple doors would be left open all the time so you could come and go as you want and you could pray and do whatever so and and israel if you actually read um uh, I'm going to go over to here first. The vine, um, the vine is the symbol. It's the natural symbol uh, symbol of Israel. Um, and if you guys want a reference, you can go to Isaiah chapter five, verse two, Matthew 21. And a good one is Ezekiel 15 through 17. If you want to write that down, um, Psalms two is another one, but it tells, uh, it gives you great detail about why the vine represents Israel. So kind of understanding that, and what's really cool, as we read verse two, Jesus points out the fruit. Um, verse five, he talks about more fruit. And then verse eight, he says much fruit. And as he's talking about the fruit of the vine, if you understand going into this, that Israel, the temple, it represented the vine. That's why Jesus says, I am the faithful. So that true is referring to I am the faithful vine. Now, I can't be sure he was looking at that archway. There could have been grapevines there, but it's likely they were walking right past Herod's temple. They, they, would, they would have seen that. And so why would he just blurt out, I'm the true vine? Because they believe that Israel was the vine. In other words, that center, if you think about the seven branch candlestick, like the menorah, um, there was another name for it. Um, that was considered the vine, the center branch, and there were three branches off both sides. And that was something they put in the temple. And that was like their object of worship. Um, and so another, I think, um, analogy to the true vine is he is that center candle. Uh, and I, and it's it's interesting to point this out before I read, because, uh, and we won't go into this study today, but on the menorah, the middle candle, according to the word of God, represented wisdom. And that candle on the tabernacle, when the children of Israel were going through the wilderness, was to always stay lit. Always. And the three candles on both sides of the menorah would that flame would would feed in and it would lean to that center candlestick, or you could call it a vine as well. Um, and we'll get into more of that in just a minute. But the idea behind this is Israel, when you think of the true vine, it was like, we are, we're the vine, we're the source, we're the source for everything. We have the kings, we're the, and so Jesus, I think, is clearly pointing out the fact that I am the true vine. And he's doing this as he walks to the garden of Gethsemane to go to his trial. Um, and so I, I, I truly believe that um, he was trying to point his disciples, because keep in mind, this whole three or four chapter area, <clears throat> you know, he's really intimate and he's really personal. Uh, the people that rejected him, they're not involved in this. This is personal. So it's the longest of the four discourses. Um, and it's right before it goes to the cross. So there's, I think it's, you'd call it ironic that he's walking past the temple and he says, I'm the true vine, knowing that there's a golden vine on the archway that's always open and available. And he says, I'm the true vine. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. He wants to make sure they're clear where they get their source is him. And to confirm why I believe that he goes on throughout this chapter right here to go into great detail about why he's the vine and who the vine dresser is. The Bible calls it the husband man, um, the, the keeper representing God to confirm what I just told you for that reason He's going to confirm how he is the true vine and we're the branches. We're not the branch because Jesus gets that title as well. But he calls us his branches and he is the true vine. And think about that candlestick that has the seven branches. I think it's kind of an interesting study. So he's walking and he says in verse one, I am seventh. I am. I am the true vine, the faithful vine. Here he is walking by that temple and my father the husband man. So right there, he's telling you the father is a representative of the husband man. Um, in other words, if you look in the concordance, uh, the husband man is, uh, is called the, the farmer, the groundskeeper, the vine, uh, the vine dresser. 
Um, and that's an analogy of God, husband, man. He even tells us right here. I promise I'm going to move forward. These are just important verses right here. <clears throat> he says, my father is the husband, man, pointing out as he walks past that temple, he's the divine dresser. Verse two, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, this is really, really important. There is a lot of debate on the internet. This is probably one of the most controversial uh, statements, one of probably the top 20 in the Bible. There's been a lot of um, Calvinistic views where they take this, this verse where it says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, you know, sends you to hell or wipes you out. That, that's a real common belief. Uh, and I've, I've looked at probably about 30 or 40 uh, references about this. That is not what this is saying. If you have a Greek um, a translation, you can clearly see in verse two, excuse me, when he says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So to illuminate the meaning of that, I have to kind of tell a, um, a thing about the branch he lifts up. Um, in the Greek, and by the way, if you guys look up Psalms 3, verse 3, it will illuminate what I'm about to tell you in great detail. Psalms 3, 3. That way you're not just trusting what I say. Oh, I think you can also start with letting, like, the first part is every branch in me. Why would he just up and throw who's in me represent? Christians. Christians. So why would he just throw them to the wayside? Well, exactly. And he goes on to explain that. But I think it's, she has a good point. If every branch in me that beareth fruit, meaning beareth not fruit, let me say it slower. Every branch in me, meaning us, his people. Every branch in me. And so he's, I love that he's identifying us as part of him too. Yeah. So watch this. This is so key. You guys got to get this. Every branch in me representing us, the people he loves. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. It doesn't mean he cuts us off or he rejects us or he sends us to hell. This is saying um, that will be a reference in verse 6. But this is referencing something. Uh, there's a Greek word called arrow. Okay, if you look up this word, he taketh away. In verse 2, the word in Greek is arrow. It means to lift up. Okay, and I'm going to tell you why that's significant. So this isn't a negative. This is a po I mean, it's not positive to be fallen, but what he's saying here is a positive. That Greek word to take um, that he taketh away is arrow to lift up. So back in the days when they had um, vines and all that before our day, they, they didn't have fancy little sticks and wiring where they could prop plants up like my wife loves to do now in her garden. Um, the, the, the vines would grow along the ground in the dirt excuse me yeah the grapes so they grow in the dirt and so a couple of ways what they would do is the vine keeper in this case it's the father the husband man they would lift up that the vine the the grape vines that are laying in the dirt and they'd, they'd lift them up and they'd wash them off they'd wash them off and they'd prop them up on rocks and i think it's kind of cool that the word of god actually has a reference to jesus as the rock i think that's cool um or they'd put sticks under it. They'd put like a V-shaped stick and they'd prop them up to keep them out of the dirt um, because they've fallen, right? But that's okay. He washes off the grapes and he elevates the grapes so they can right, they, produce good fruit. They they elevate that vine. That just made me emotional just thinking about it. They, 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 they elevate, elevate that, that vine to whether it's to, it needs more sun or whatever because exactly. that vine is not producing the fruit. So ultimately it's, his way of helping that believer yeah. be able to um, obtain fruiting, basically. Yeah, and I think I to to what she's saying. It's going to mention purging in a minute, but I want to reiterate this scripture in verse two does not reference hell or the cutting. Well, because remember he said he identifies us as his. He says every branch in me, meaning us, the ones he loves. Okay. He's identifying us as his part of his branches. But when people see this, every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away as if he cuts us off. See, that's the enemy, just like the enemy, to turn this verse into, well, if you don't listen to him, to hell with you. And I'm not cussing. I mean that literally. Because Right? Because that's what the enemy wants us to do, is he wants us to see his words and twist them. By the way, that word, um, you've heard the word Wicca. Um, it comes from the word 
uh, wicker, which means to twist. Mm -hmm. This verse has been so greatly twisted as if, oh, if we don't follow him, he cuts us off. No. In verse two, he identifies we are part of him. He's, and if you read it in the Greek and it's original context that it was written, we have an English Bible. He taketh away. If you know, yeah, he lifts us up. He washes our feet, you could say. He washes us so that we can bear good fruit. Now, when we get to verse six, we'll talk about something else. If you guys want to read, so you have to read this. Psalms 3.3 3 will give you great detail, and, you, and you'll see that it's not me just coming up with this. Um, and so there's one other thing I want to mention. Uh, chapter 15. Yeah, it means lift it up, so I have that. So I want to point that out. Now, we're going to keep. So he's, he's saying, look, I love, I love everyone. Um, I'm not cutting them off. I'm lifting them up. So they're not cut off. So that's interesting. Um, that's, I just want you guys to, to keep that. And um, yeah. And he says, and every branch that beareth fruit. Now he's talking the ones that bear fruit, by the way, notice it says, and every branch that beareth fruit. That's key doesn't say fruits because that word fruit is a collective word that he puts together. Alana can read them to you. There's a reference to what he means by fruit. Fruit represents love, by the way. And can you read off the fruits of the spirit? This is a, so when it says fruit in the last half of verse two, it's actually collectively saying these because it's not saying fruits. Right. Fruit is putting it as a whole. Oh yeah, go ahead. So the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And that's from Galatians 5, 22 through 23. And so that, I think that was important that we gave you that note because those are the fruits of the spirit. Notice that fruit, uh, love is the first one. Now, first Corinthians 13, verse four, <laughs> and the King James says, charity suffereth long. That means love. That means to give. But if you replace anywhere in scripture where it says fruit with the word love, you know, when, it, when you heard me, you guys have heard me say that, um, look at a tree, it might have a bad orange, but if but it's generally good fruit, or if the love you see generally always lines up, you know, you, those nine fruits, you can see that in the fruit. Um, it's a good tree because every good tree is going to have a bad fruit. It's going to happen. In other words, or you could say um, it can, it can miss the mark on loving properly. Or a healthy tree though should have should predominantly healthy bear fruit. healthy fruit you might have one rotten moment you know that well, you could say that day that you that you fail we still have right flesh, so. i have days i have kids you know we have a new family and sometimes i handle it wrong i do obviously so it doesn't mean my whole fruit tree is bad it means i learn from that jesus lifts me up he washes me off mm -hmm. so i can bear new fresh fruit and i can learn from it but it's not a whole tree of rotten fruit mm -hmm. so these and I'm spending a lot of time here because it's so important that he's pointing out the fact that he, the branches, his branches, us, were a part of him. And he says, look, if they, if they beareth not fruit, he'll lift them up and wash them um, until they do, hopefully, right? Um, but we have free will. And it says every branch that beareth fruit, meaning they do bear fruit, all nine, those, those, those fruits she mentioned in Galatians. Um, he purgeth. Um, and so purge, purgeth in the King James, it means prune. Um, Alana can explain what it's like to prune a, a plant, why that's significant. Why do you say cleanse? Yeah. Well, pruning, think about it. Um, these are all little key words. He didn't just put them in here just because they're, they're fun words. Purging has to do with when a plant grows. My wife taught me this. Sometimes you have to clip certain branches a certain length, or you have to pull leaves that don't belong there, or um, vines that don't belong there or anything that's not a part of that tree you know that would that would cause it not to grow the way it's supposed to you have to it has to be just like the previous chapters we have to die to self you know spiritually we have to become saved but then daily we have to what was the word we used but daily um we have to die to ourselves daily mm -hmm. we have to be pruned daily and so jesus is so amazing that he's using all these analogies um and sometimes, you know, sometimes that pruning process is painful. Sure. You know, tree might wilt for a while and come back. I don't know how that works, but. Yeah. And 
I think that, but mm-hmm. ultimately the, the goal is going through that, those trials, yeah. um, that pruning process, even though that's painful, ultimately um, it, it brings more fruit. It does. It allows, a, just like when he talks about the four types of seed, it doesn't, if you let something grow up too long and it's not pruned or it's not observed or it's not, or you're not in the word daily, the enemy, the enemy's vines can get in there. The, the false vine, I'm going to call it. Um, if we don't make sure we observe to prune away, get the stuff that's not supposed to be there that, that tends to grow. Um, it has to be dealt with on a daily basis. And I can tell you guys, you guys know what it's like to have those days on your way to church every single time you'll you'll catch a train you're there somebody's you know mad because they didn't have their clothes ready for school or yeah those are those little weeds those little things that if we don't maintain our garden our spiritual garden we end up with a wasteland and so jesus is referring to this it seems really basic but there's some deep stuff and he says you know he'll take them away clean them up and every branch that bears fruit all of the fruits he purged he keeps them clean. He cleans them. He washes them. He, he cares for them. Well, that it, to bring more fruit. Exactly. To make room, like it says in the last part of verse two, that it may bring forth more fruit. Because that's how good he is. Jesus is so good. And he says, um, verse three, now ye are, are, let's see, now ye are, means everybody, are clean through the word, the word of God, which I have spoken unto you. The faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Um, you know, there's two different types where we talk about, um, uh, the Rhema and the, the, logos. the logos, the logos, and we're not going to get into all that, but there's, you can get the word by sight, by, by hearing spiritual hearing. Um, God makes it available to, you know, I've heard this question, well, somebody never met God or never met Jesus. Are they going to hell? Well, the Bible says he makes himself known through his creation, through more than one Avenue. He makes it through your ears, through your eyes. I mean, we have a, we have a guy that goes to my church that's blind and that guy is more spiritually in tune as, uh, as a servant word based. I mean, that guy, just because he's, he's using his senses, he's using more of his senses and he's paying attention to things. Whereas a lot of times we're, this might be off subject. We get so sidetracked on um, other stuff. Like Timothy talks about, we get into worldly affairs mm-hmm. that we forget to go out and check our, our vine to make sure there's not the wrong uh, stuff coming up and then it grows up next thing you know it's choked out the word and you're spiritually spiritually become dead and and jesus uh, references here coming up what happens to those you know remember judas in john chapter uh, 13 right at the end of john chapter 13 literally jesus has judas at the table right next to him and judas elects not to partake and, and instantaneously, right after that, remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, uh, I think Jesus said, or I don't know if it was Jesus, but Satan entered into him or something to that effect. Mm-hmm. As soon as we decide to reject him, he may not want to, but he's going to endorse our decision of free will because he's a God of free will and of love. And I'm sure painfully he endorses, said, look, get it over with. If you're going to do it, do it, do it quickly. And so, and he talks about this in verse three. Uh, verse four says abide in me that means that means camp out let me just spend time that means don't show up and go hey honey i'm home and then go go back to the back of the house no abide means you set you exchange you commune you talk you um you yeah you're present you're emotionally which i struggle with sometimes and i need to work on you're emotionally present so when he says in verse four abide in me be present pay attention don't don't put your phone down Get in the word. He says, abide in me and I in you. He's telling his disciples, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, because there's not very many branches besides one in the tabernacle, Aaron's rod, that can, that life. So think about it. No life comes out of a dead branch, a branch that's not attached to a true vine or, you know, a tree, tree trunk, whatever you want to call it. So he says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. We can't do this alone. We thought we could in the garden, and we see how that worked out. Um, and so um, I wanted to mention, yeah, I think I'm good on that. Um, let's see. Verse four. 
Yes. Um, he says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. And there's a comma. That's a, except it abide in the vine, which what we just talked about. It needs its source, its life, its oxygen, its nurturing. It needs it from the true vine, the true vine that he mentioned in the first verse. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Period. And he says in verse five, I am the vine. I love that. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love this. He says, ye, all of you, ye are the branches. You're my branches. The same, excuse me, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. That's pretty self-explanatory. Love. For without me, ye can do nothing. I love that verse. I highlighted this for this reason. I don't care what you believe or what religion or denomination or where you are, what you're doing. This verse right here said, for without me, you can do nothing. He didn't say some things, partial things, a lot of things. He said, without me, you can do nothing. That rings. Verse six, if a man abide not in me, here we go. Excuse me. This is the part, this is not the good part. If a man abide not in me, in other words, dwelling with me, like supping with me, communing with me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. A branch, not the branch, not his branch. He's cast forth as a branch. So it's no identity there. And is withered. And men, okay, by the way, that word men is referring to not the husband man, not the vine keeper. That means men of the world. That means the enemy, the enemy's people, the enemy, like it's the opposite of the husband man. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. This is very literal. I, I want to tell you why this is interesting. Uh, a grapevine. So when it's alive, it has one thing it can do. This is really key. It's, it's so a living, you ever guys try to burn living wood? It's impossible to burn. It's just hard to burn. It's got to dry out. But here's the thing about this vine. So when he says um, it's cast out the branch and it's withered, a grapevine literally has no purpose. You can't, it's not even good for firewood. It doesn't burn well. And when it's dead, you can't build anything with it. You can't, you can't even use it to burn. It has one purpose to produce grapes, vine. It does, excuse me, to produce the fruit that comes out of it. It's not even good to burn. What good is it to be a branch that's not serving its purpose? You can't even use it to burn it. It's worthless. Um, we have kids. Yeah, we have kids. So, um, so he says, he is cast forth as a branch, just a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. What do you want to say? I just have this like little vision of you think about where it says if a man abide not in me so you think about just a tree so if, if what happens when you have if you don't abide in him you as a branch are basically going to wither up and die mm -hmm. and eventually that's gonna that limb is gonna break and fall to the ground and I have this vision of people or the world Mm -hmm. going to come and when you're saying you're cleaning up your yard you're going to pick up those dead limbs you're going to throw it into the fire to clean up your yard they're not even big enough to burn they're not even they don't even serve a purpose i would rather i mean think about it why why, why even be a dead branch like there's nothing more worthless than something you can't burn you can't eat it you can't you it literally only is there to grow to produce fruit we are alive to bring god glory that's it that's the reason we exist, period. The problem is I myself have been guilty. I spent most of my life abiding in myself, thinking I could grow without being hooked to the true vine. Adam and Eve, same thing. They're like, well, we didn't need to, you know, Satan's like, well, you don't, you don't need to, you know, he wants, he doesn't want you to know what's on that tree because he doesn't want you to become gods and you don't need God. You're your own God. We're that way. We don't need a tree to, for our branch to grow off of because we're our own tree, but we're not. It's not, we're not even good. We don't, 
I'm going to say this. I'm going to move on. We literally have no purpose on this earth. We might think we do to, to, to gain money, to gain friends and all that. That all goes away when you die. I'm just being, being honest. If we're not advancing the kingdom and we're not bringing God glory, we have not fulfilled our purpose on this planet, period. And that's exactly what he's saying in verse six. If it's withered, it'll be gathered up by men. That's meaning not the father. That's mean other people, the world. The world gets a hold of you, it's gathered up, and it's, and it's, um, we're live on our, it's a given. We're going to get that at least once every time we do it. Um, um, we are, um, we're literally just good to be to bagged in a bundle and put by the road. There's no, what's the point? So serve your purpose. And he says a dead branch removes, uh, removed from life is dead. So if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done. It doesn't say not if you ask. So watch this. This is confused. Well, I want a million dollars. It'll be done. No, he's talking to the believer, the faithful. He's referring to this. If you look at it in context, he's saying, ask of me as a faithful person, something that's offered in my faith, that he offers. We like to add a million dollars. That's not what it's saying. And, and you know what? If we ask, uh, he, look, he might fulfill it later. He might fulfill it in heaven. I mean, yeah, please, please. So when we abide in the Father, in Jesus, we will, our, our heart's desire is for our will to be his will, ultimately. And kind of like a marriage to become one, right? So ultimately whatever our heart wants should be what our father wants and, it should and vice versa we should have that basically imprinted in us so when we are asking anything when we go to our heavenly father and we pray ultimately as long as we don't have the flesh getting a hold of us it should be his will it's true and we, and we can't we can't we can't serve any purpose if we think we're the true vine. We're just going to wither up and die spiritually. And you know what? F look, emotionally, physically, if you guys have been broken hearted, think about this. If you've been broken hearted and you lose your source, we always think it's people like husbands, wives, whatever. If you don't have your source, you're never going to have joy. People always try to be happy. Uh, we, we always say, I think I heard this at Word of God Ministries. Happiness is based on what's happening. Joy. So. If you don't have the joy of the Lord, you, you might have a happy day, sad days. You know, you have a good day. Oh, uh, you go on a skiing trip. We're going to tomorrow. We're going to go on a skiing trip. It'll be awesome. 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 You're happy. You get there. The slopes are closed down. Then it's that you're sad. You're sad. You're sad. Oh, but they have one down the street. You're, you're happy. You're happy. Happy. Uh, but it's melted. This is, so this is how happiness is a roller coaster. Happiness is not joy. Happiness is based on what's happening around you, how you feel. It's circumstantial. It's circumstantial. It has nothing to do with the joy of the Lord. Perfect example of someone dies. We all deal with this. At a Christian wedding, there, here's what should be at a Christian wedding, or excuse me, a Christian uh, funeral. Bittersweet. Uh, sadness, but joy in the sadness, because like Jesus said, you should be happy for me if you knew where I was going. Remember that in the last chapter? And a Christian funeral, there should be sadness. It's very common. There's five stages of, of mourning. But there should be an underlying joy that for some reason, even in the midst of that that darkness, and we've recently, both of us went through this, there should be an underlying joy that at that funeral, even though you're crying, your eyes are full of tears, I'm going to think about that. You still know that that person's with Jesus. So that joy sustains you because it doesn't change. It reminds me of um, somewhere in the Bible, it says, um, he came in the form of godliness and thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Remember that? And I think it's Philippians. You know that word form in the Greek means morphe. Morphe. It's form is the innermost part of you that can't be changed. Our fashion, our body, like Jesus being wrapped in flesh in John 1.1. 1, 1, that's our fashion. That's our happiness. So this is a weird, it's a weird analogy, but I'm trying to explain something. Form or morphe, the innermost part, who we are cannot be altered who we are should be i just thought about that when we talked about the joy we can choose our joy we're with jesus right 
no matter what somebody does, no matter what they try to put on you, it doesn't change who you are inside. It's your morphe, your joy. I don't know where I got that from. Holy spirit is your morphe. It doesn't change with the seasons, seasons in your life, seasons, winter, summer, spring, doesn't change your outfit changes, your fashion, your happiness, happy, sad, snow, you know, whatever, same idea. You can't alter joy. If you have it and it's in the Lord, one more thing, marriages. Um, some people have good advice. They've been in long marriages, a hundred years. Other people have had failed marriages and that's where they get their advice, what not to do. So often we try to get our, this is so good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So often we try to go to each other when we're having a bad day. Imagine we're all underwater right now, me and my wife, my wife and I, sorry, mom, we're underwater. I'm trying to go to Alana to make me happy, to get me happy underwater, but I'm not going to the source above water where the oxygen is. I'm trying to feed her and feed back. That's happiness. Joy is up at the top. That's where the oxygen is. We both need to go to the source instead of trying to get it from each other and try to be happy. We're not going to be happy amongst ourselves if he's not the source of our joy. And so this is important because he talks about joy here in verse 11. I don't know how I, I didn't really realize that, but it's around verse 11. But he says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done according to the Lord, not just some random thing. Verse eight, herein is my father. He's saying, this is where my father's in it. Herein is my father glorified. That means made known, manifested. When something's glorified, there could be a person in the room that you know. I like to, to really explain words because we say glory all the time. Glory, 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 but nobody really knows what it means. Glory means if, if my wife's in the room and I don't know she's there, she's present like God's present, but it's not until it's made known, it's manifested. Um, um, I was thinking a holy set apart. Yeah, glory means it's, man, it's made known. So he says right here in verse eight, herein is my father made known, glorified. <laughs> my kids in back that all of you, that ye bear much fruit or much love. So shall ye be my disciples. That's who they bear fruit. And it says in verse nine, as the father hath loved me, he always does that. I love Jesus. Notice he, he, he sends it to the father first. As my father first loved me, loved me, so have I loved you. So he's saying, I love you like he loves me. So we should love others like he loves us because that's how the father loves him because he god made man in his own image so if jesus does it like he told his disciples when he was washing the feet if i'm washing feet and you're made in my image and you know you were made in my image we should wash feet he always leads by example and he says if i have loved you continue ye in my love uh obedience by the way alana this is interesting obedience is a love response which is cool because when i talked about first corinthians 13 verse 4 through 7 we talked about uh the four loves eros phileo or philio um uh, eros philio storge and agape well what makes agape love different it's god's love but more importantly it's love that we have through obedience like there's people you don't like but you love them that's obedience obedience is a love response that's what agape love is what that's our german shepherd he wants to be in the video i love that dog's god backwards it's kind of cool <laughs> this is brady say hi brady say hi to everybody people love dogs there he is okay so and so he wants to be in the bible study this would be good for you, know, you can hang out um maybe he wants outside so verse 11 um, so joy, I said, joy is unchanging. Happiness goes with the, you know, weather. I made a note that the word joy, Jesus, others, and then you. That's kind of cool. Think of that that way. Joy, Jesus first, others second, and then worry about yourself. Yeah. Joy. These things I've spoken unto you that made that my joy might remain in you. He's so good. And that your joy might be full. Notice his is first. This is my commandment that ye love one another. Because remember the first two commandments, love God, love others. Love God, love your neighbor. First two. 
the Bible actually says those are the key ones. I mean, they're all important, but those, those first two, if you don't love God, you're not going to love others. Let me let them out. If you don't love God, you won't love others. And if you don't love others, you can forget the other commandments. And so I think it's so cool that he says, um, this is my commandment that ye love one another. I have loved um, as I have loved you. <clears throat> We're going to let our puppy out real quick. That's all right. So this is so good, man. I mean, we're not even at the good part. And then he says in verse 13 of John chapter 15, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Remember Jesus called Abraham and Judas his friends, because when you're his friend, he lets you in on the plan. Because right here in John, it says that um, a servant's not greater than his master, but the master doesn't leave his servant out. He lets us, l listen to this. What's cool, the people were called his friends, like Abraham and Judas, like these guys right here. He lets them know the inner plans. He lets them know what he's doing. This master lets his servants know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? The ones he calls his friends. And so when he says, this is important, greater love had no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He calls Judas and Abraham his friends. And then in John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son uh, that he shall not perish everlasting that whole that whole thing he brought abraham in genesis 22 up to the mount of olives uh up to uh the mountain and he says slay your son isaac was a picture of jesus abraham was a picture of god he brought his friend abraham up to the hill god did to show him what he would have to do in the same place two thousand years later but instead of god it was abraham and isaac it was uh, Jesus. And he says, this is important. He says, uh, Abraham, take your son, verse 22, whom thou lovest. The law first mentioned, the first time you, you see love in the Bible is Genesis 22. And at the same place, in the same analogy, he's pointing to 2000 years later, well, God will bring his son, Jesus, but he doesn't offer the ram, he offers his son, the lamb. And Genesis 22 is a picture of love because it was first mentioned there pointing to John 3.16. And so God took his friend, Abraham, who knew his inner plans up to the hill to show him this. And so when you see this, I wasn't on a rabbit trail. This is good. When you see this, that he says, greater love, verse 13, hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Did God not, did Jesus not lay down his life? See, we think, first think about this we always think okay yeah no greater love than if i lay down my life for a friend which is true but he's actually pointing to jesus he always does he's a man and he laid down his life for his friends truly and why is it more special than when we lay down our life for our friends watch this if your son and someone else's son was hanging off a cliff and you had to pick their son over now i could see if you jump out in front of a car to save a child i would do that because I'm wired that way. But would you let your son fall to save somebody else's son? That's divine love. That's agape love. We don't have that as pure as God does. He gave up his own son for your son, for us, for me, for you. Greater love. There is no greater love than the love Jesus had. He had the passion. Acts talks about that. And he says, you are my friends. If you do what, I, uh, let's see, uh, do which, what verse man? Hey, Yes. You are my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you, because obedience is proof of love. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord do, Lord meaning owner. But I have called you friends. Why did I preach that ahead of time before reading it? I knew that was coming. I've called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father. I have made known unto you. Didn't we just mention that? His friends, he makes, he lets us know his inner plan like his his real plans those that know him when people say i don't understand the king james i don't understand the bible maybe you should spend more time not saying you don't knowing him instead of just being able to read the you know if someone walks up to you and they write their name down and it says alana and you could anybody could read that but if she just scribbles her signature i'm gonna know it's her because i know her She's my wife. I spent time. I've invested in her. Like he said, I have abode with her. 
That means spend time, invest. I think that's amazing. He says, for all things that I've heard of my father, I have made known to you. So if you don't understand the Bible, it's okay. If you really pursue knowing him, he'll reveal it to you. Because I was not a well-read person and he he revealed to me who he was. It's really that simple. Um, so verse, um, yeah, 16. Yes. And he says, oh, I love this right here. Um, I, under the word, you're, you're, um, but I have called you friends. I made a note. He would always reveal to his friends his plans. That's right. Verse 16, ye have not chosen me. Listen to this. We haven't chosen him, not fully. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Think about this. Why did he, why did he do what he did? Why did he die? Why did he go through all the, the, the unfair trial, the scourging, the embarrassment, being stripped naked, having his, you know, why did he go through that? Bible says his passion. That's why I like the name of that movie. No reason, because agape love says, you don't owe me anything. It's not about myself. I love you. And that's the end of the story. When you love somebody, verse 16 is talking about this. When you love somebody, it's always about the other person. If it's agape love, always. God only had agape love. Jesus only had agape love. He says, ye have not chosen me but I've chosen you. Grace. I love grace. Sorry. So when I became a minister, I had to get legally ordained. It's just a, the, the state requires it. But I love this next word, statement. I, I do. This is personal to me. I love this. I've chosen you and ordained you to follow man's laws, to follow God's law. I had to get legally ordained here on earth but God's the one that calls us to be ordained first. If he doesn't ordain you, you can sign whatever certificate you want. It won't do any good. He says, and I, and I, uh, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye should, shall ask of the father in my name, catch that in his name. No other way. He may give it to you. Verse 17. These things I command you, that ye love one another, period. That's why uh, when he was talking to the lawyer in the book of Matthew, he said, Jesus, Jesus tells a parable because he's trying to get to a spiritual truth. He's like, he says, so who do I have to love? What's the rules behind love? And so Jesus is thinking, everyone's your neighbor. So he gives a parable of the good Samaritan we'll talk about one day. And at the end of that parable, he says, now, who's your friend? He wanted, to, he wanted to know if the man understood that everyone you see and touch, because it's in my image, should be your friend, because you're my friend, and you're a mess. We're a mess, but he loves us. Can I mention the Barabbas thing briefly, really quick? Because these are going to go quick after this. This reminds me of the story of Barabbas when Jesus is on trial, unfair trial. Barabbas was a murderer, a rapist, everything else. He was on trial. It was a law, I believe, in the Jewish law in Rome, um, where they, they would set they would set a captive free. Of course, Jesus was on trial for nothing, but they 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 said that he committed blasphemy. And so you have Barabbas and Jesus standing side by side. I was there's a reason I went to this. I'm trying to think why I went to this. And so you have Jesus, son of the Father, on one side, that's Jesus Christ, and you have Barabbas, whose Greek name was Jesus Baraba. Bara means son of, Abba, as you know, means father. You have Jesus, Baraba, Jesus, son of the father on one side, Jesus Christ, the son of the father on the other side, and you have Pilate who washes his hands. And if you imagine this being a, a parallel, if he represented God in this parallel, washing his hands, both of these people he loved. He doesn't see things like we do. He loved Barabbas. Jesus, Son of the Father, Jesus Christ, the same. Pilate represented God. We are Barabbas. We're free and we're guilty. And so I think it's interesting right here in verse, um, was it verse um, 15, 16? 
Yeah. Well, I want to say where he says in 16, you haven't chose me, but I chose you, even though we don't deserve Romans 6, 23 says the wage of sin is death, the, the gift of God's eternal life. We don't deserve life, but Jesus goes, I love you. I'm going to give you life. And so I just wanted to point that out. That's the kind of love that he has. He says in verse 17, I command you to love one another. Verse 18, by the way, he says the word hate seven times here. He says in 18, if the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. This is people that follow him, that act like him, that look like him, that sound like him. Look, people are going to hate you when you talk about Jesus. You put it on your shirt or you you bring it up, you know, I don't know, downtown or with your buddies. You're going to stick out like a sore thumb. It's not easy doing this sometimes. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it's me they hated. Um, they hated me before it hated you. Verse 19, if ye were of the world, in other words, if you join them and you don't stand up for Jesus, the world would love you. Uh, they'd love his own. But because you are not of the world, this is the Christian, the believer, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you because it hates me first. So don't worry when you feel attacked when you're a Christian. A person attacking you, they think they hate you, but it's not you they hate, it's him. This is why it's all over the world, politics, everywhere else. When you mention Jesus, when you mention other stuff, you can you can dance naked at the Super Bowl or half naked. Nobody cares. I mean, there's a little, you know, you can talk about any religion you want. Nobody cares. If you mention Jesus, they shut you down. They hated me first. And so um, real quick, yeah. Um, so verse 20 says, remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord or owner. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you because we're in his image. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Very simple, but it's very deep. Um, let's see here, 21. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. See what I mean? They don't, they don't know who sent him. Verse 22, and that was all through the Bible. Verse 22, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had, um, they had, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin, no covering, the cloak, the gl no glory. Just like Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they lost their glory covering and they were, they were wrapped in flesh. It says, he that hateth me hateth my father also. That's rough. I want to point something out right there in verse 20. It says, go ahead. Yeah. Verse, so, but now they have no cloak for their sin. In other words, their sin was laid bare. They were exposed. That cloak is a covering to, yeah. to keep that hidden. So go back and read it again in context. And so, so you're right. I'm, you're absolutely right. It's spoken unto them. They had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. So in other words, because of the words of, of Christ, when he was speaking before they were able to hide their sin, but sure. their word convicted them and exposed their sin in their heart, ultimately. Yeah. 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 He's exactly right. Oh, that's awesome. So um, it's interesting. Verse 20, it says, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Now I want to point this out. In the Greek, this there's two words for this diako. Um, so so dioko, it can either mean to run off like a dog, they'll persecute you, run you off, or to overtake like a uh, competition. And this is referring to they will also try to overtake you. I want to keep the context. If they have kept uh they have kept my saying they will also keep uh, keep yours also. They will try to not run you off, but they will try to overtake you. That's how the Greek has this in context. Um, I'm going to read these last couple of verses. I want to mention a couple of things here and then we'll wrap it up. But he says, um, verse 21, I'll read it again. I'll just read it. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Verse 22, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin, cloak for their sin. Verse 23, I think I'm repeating, but it's okay. It's the word of God. 
He that hateth me hate my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no other man did, they had not had sin, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. This is referring to Judaism, the judicial, the Jewish system is what it's referring to, Judaism, or the Jewish system at that time. So verse 25 says, um, but this cometh to pass. And when he says that, it will. That the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Now, right there, verse 25 is telling us something. He says, this will come to pass what's written in their law. Speaking of verse 24, the Jude Jude uh, Judaism, the, the belief in the Jewish people had. He says in verse 25, what's written in their law, <laughs> it will be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. And he's talking about Psalms 69, 4. And can you go, and then Psalms 35, 19. Can you read, can you go to Psalms 69, 4 real quick? I kind of pop this on it real quick. Or we can do it right here if you want. Mm -hmm. While she's looking this up, I'm going to read something to you. Actually, I'll let her read it. So he's saying, um, this will come to pass that the word will be fulfilled that's written in your Jewish law. Talking about um, it'll be fulfilled that they hated me without a cause. Psalm 69, 4. Go ahead and read that. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. So he's saying many people will hate him. And I made a reference to Psalms 35, 19. Can you check and see if there's something about that? Psalms 35, 19. You got to figure out this microphone system. But another one. Yeah. Psalms 35. Yeah. 19. All right. Yes, go ahead. Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. Yeah, that's interesting. So remember you're saying, I'm going to fulfill what's it's going to fulfill exactly what's, what's written in your book and your thing. So I want to read something. Um, the Sanhedrin, this is really cool. And we're, we're, and we're just about done. The Sanhedrin were basically uh, religious leaders. They were like the, the law, you know, the, the, Republican Democrat at the time. Um, it was called the Sanhedrin. There were Pharisees and Sadducees, religious leaders. They were actually required this prayer in all synagogues for each Sabbath. And this is crazy. And here's what it says. They had to read this. Let not the Nazarenes, that's the Christians, okay, the Gentiles, whatever, the Nazarenes and other heretics perish as in a moment. Let the Nazarenes, other heretics be blotted out of the book of life let the nazarenes and other heretics never be enrolled with the righteous this is a mandated prayer that was read in the synagogues during sabbath every sabbath commanded by the sanhedrin the, the jewish supreme court um i want to point that out um i was supposed to actually i was going to read this in the beginning of the next chapter but i just mentioned in verse 24 that it said if i had not done among them the works which another other man did uh, verse 25 but it cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled which is written in the law so the jewish the, the hierarchy they had a lot of religious lots of religious you know 613 laws actually um and they believed a lot of crazy things and i just wanted to point that out so there was a lot of hatred for gentiles outside the even at the the feast of uh tabernacles feast of booths the gentiles were that they, they wouldn't weren't allowed to come in they were on the outside so they were considered heathens they they actually believed that gentiles that's us uh we're only good to help fire get hot, to actually fuel the fire of hell to burn to make it hotter i'm not making that up so they were they were hated i would have been hated in that time they thought they were the first chosen by god which they were but they didn't believe that gentiles they were all they were is a coal for a fire and we still have groups like that today and so he says, it might be fulfilled, which is written. And we read those verses to you. Verse 26, but when the comforter, that's the Holy Spirit, when the comforter is capitalized, anytime you see a Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God, if it's capitalized, that's the Holy Spirit. If it's not capitalized, it's it's some other spirit. It's our spirit. Um, he says, but when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth capitalized, 
the Holy Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father. So it's part of it. He shall testify of me. Notice verse 26 makes the comforter part of him and also the spirit of truth part of him. That is pointing to a triune God. There's a word called ikad or the Trinity it means equal in nature, separate in person, submissive in duties. I made a note of that. Um, I say that because right there when it says um, in the last half of 26, it says a spirit of truth, which proceeded from the father, he shall testify of me. Remember, it has to be Jewish law that it had to be out of the mouth of two or three witnesses mm -hmm. that something would be confirmed, like could be written into law. Well, here we go. I will send unto you the father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeded from the father. He shall testify me. There's your two witnesses. He always does that. Matter of fact, Jesus always seems to do his really, really cool stuff on the Sabbath, the day they said you can't do the cool stuff. And by the way, Sabbath is made for man. We've made it a religious practice, and it's 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 crazy. So he says, yeah, the, he shall testify me. Verse 27, last verse. And ye also shall bear witness. First John 5, 7 talks about this. Because ye have been with me from the beginning. So, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, please. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. You forget. So the word comforter in Greek is, I don't know how to pronounce it accurately, but it's parakletos. Uh, it's Strong's 3875 from para, beside, and kaleo, to call. Hence, it is it originally meant in a passive sense one who is called to another side to offer support. This passive sense was gradually replaced by the more active meaning of mediator. The word signifies an intercessor, comforter, helper, helper advocate, counselor. In non-biblical literature, parakletos had the technical meaning of an attorney who appears in court in another's behalf. I think we even mentioned counselor yeah. in the Bible too. Somewhere. Yep. The Holy Spirit leads believers to a greater apprehension of gospel truths. In addition to general help and guidance, he gives the strength to endure the hostility of the world system. I think even last week we alluded to the other when the other comforter kind of thing happened, chapter 13, I think it was. We talked about the comfortless means the fatherless, the orphan, and the comforter is intercessor, mediator. He says another comforter. And remember, we talked about there's in the Greek, there's two different words used for another. One means the same kind, the other one means something different so he says i'm going to send you another intercessor meaning a different intercessor referring to the holy spirit which is part of the godhead the trinity mm -hmm. um and it'll be greater not not that it's not greater in quality but because now it's inside of us when he dies and he goes to the father it's in greater numbers now it's that same word and that same spirit in us in greater numbers you can even see as the church and acts grew by the thousands quickly mm -hmm. They'll do greater works, meaning more qu uh, quantity of works, not quality, because it's still the word of God. So the other comforter is another intercessor, when you say it's a good way to kind of break it down, called the Holy Spirit, capitalized. Um, I'm done reading. I want to just mention one little side note I had up here that's kind of a fun for all you people that like the little, I know Alicia and Curtis, they like all those little nuggets and Ryan and Zach. So here's a little nugget that I have that I, that I thought would be kind of fun. Um, I think uh, in this chapter, I mentioned this earlier, um, verse two, he mentions fruit, verse five, he mentions more fruit, verse eight, much fruit. He does this all the time, patterns all through Bible. Um, uh, verses one through 11 of John 15 are the relationship with Christ, the anointed one. Uh, verses 12 through 17 has to do with the relationship with each other. The commandments tend to do that. And verses uh, Let's see here, 18 through 16, four um, had to do with, yeah, the relationship with the world. So this is actually broken down in sections. You can study this different ways. Um, and I want to point out one last thing here on that menorah, that seven branch candlestick I talked about. I could share a picture of it, but it basically looks like a lamp, a lamp with like three branches on both sides and one in the middle. This is just a fun thing that I looked up. Um, the outer branches, there's three on each side. 
There's one in the middle. It represents wisdom. Isaiah 11, 2, you can look up the seven um, gifts of the Holy Spirit, seven anointings of the Spirit. Isaiah 11, 2 will give you those. The center one being wisdom. So if God represents the number one, one means God, Aleph, L means one. And six is the number of man. I think it's interesting that the branch in the middle, since there's six on the outside, three on each side, he's the one, the wisdom in the middle. And those three candles on each side lean toward wisdom. Um, and the middle candle is never allowed to be put out. One means God. Six is the number of man. So one plus six is seven, which means complete. The, uh, the number of the biblical implication of the number seven is complete. These are for all you Bible deep studiers. If you guys that like um, 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 uh, Gematria, you'll, you'll appreciate this. I say that because he's mentioned in the vine. We are the branches. Think about these three branches. There's six that are on both sides, the number of man. Also, if you look at the, the seven feasts of um, Israel, there's three in the beginning of the year and the first month, and there's three in the seventh uh, month. And then right smack in the middle of those two, uh, those three, there's one feast that has to do with the church right in the middle. And that's seven feasts. So not everybody's into this, but if you look at Gematria, which is the study of Hebrew, Hebrew, is, um, Hebrew doesn't have a numbering system like English. They have what's called a, um, a pictogram or a pictograph. It's a picture, a picture language that depending on where you put the symbols, it makes different words. And so each one of those symbols represent a number. So like in the Bible, you'll notice they'll spell out the 144,000, but they don't use numbers. They spell it out. So they use Hebrew pictures to identify exactly alphanumeric numbers so the reason why i like gematria so much is it's all through the king james bible and i think it's interesting that the branch the seven branch candlestick is something that was kind of worshipped in the jewish temple and they actually turned it into nine that's a whole different study we talked about that briefly and um um why did i say that to say yeah that the, there's seven feasts seven branches um and here he is calling us identifying us as his branches and he's the one in the middle and um even the seven branch candlestick in the tabernacle um it's really cool i'm gonna say this and i'm done if you understand how it was made the bible talks about it was beaten from one piece of gold not built it was beaten from one piece of gold and and on that menorah um there were each branch had three clusters of almonds so one branch had three three and three so that's nine well nine times six outer branches is 54 and the center branch had four clusters of three what i'm getting at is those clusters and they were different phases of an almond which represents the word of God. And that's another study. What I'm getting at is those almonds total 66 on that branch or on that candlestick, the King James calls it. There's 66 books in the Bible. And when you walk through that tabernacle, the seven branch candlestick would have Isaiah 11, two's anointings of the Holy of the spirit illuminating over to the top of the shoe bread. It was in a, it was in a tent. So the only natural illumination over to that bread, to that word, was the illumination of the 66, uh, in other words, the word in those 66 books would illuminate, that spirit from those would illuminate the word. Like it's, there's all kinds of gematria and cool uh, symbolisms and all that. Um, and it was on this seven branch candlestick that also, it all goes together is what I'm saying. And I'm probably going too far off on that. But maybe one day we'll do a whole Bible study on these really cool kind of hidden mysteries and things like that. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. But anyway, that's your little nugget. As you guys that know me, I, I tend to rattle on too much. Um, so, yeah, he's the true vine. He's the center branch and the candlestick. He is uh, life. If we are disconnected from him, uh, we have no life. Last thing. In that tabernacle there was what's called the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. And everybody wanted to be Aaron. They wanted to be the leader, the head priest. So God says, all right, write your name on a stick, on a branch, a rod. 
and lay it, lay it, you know, lay it down. And in the morning, whoever, whichever one's still a lot, whichever one's alive, the true branch, in other words, whichever stick is alive, they're going to be like Aaron, his, his, his rod budded. Remember what it budded? Mama blossoms. Mm. The word almond blossoms. The word is blossoming from a branch that's not hooked to a tree. Well, there's only one branch that grows without any other life source. The branch, Jesus, that branch budded, the almond tree, the almond, which I believe is the tree of life in the garden, because almond has to do with the word of God. And the first tree that would bud in, in Jerusalem, uh, in the city of Luz, it was called, was the almond tree. It was the first fruit. Funny, because there was a, there was a feast called the Feast of First Fruits. And that happens right after Passover, I believe. And then the first fruit buds, the almond tree, tree of life. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. Yeah, I just thought I'd point that out. So there's your really cool nugget. There's a whole lot more to that. And so that branch is the only one that grows without a source because it is the source. We are not able to, to grow without being hooked to the true mm -hmm. vine. And that's why the story is so beautiful. He needs to lift us up, not to cut us off, but to prune us, to clean us off, wash our feet, set us back down so we can bear new fruit because that's how good he is. Yeah. God is so good. My wife is amazing. I love my wife. Mm -hmm. And she's my spiritual. We, we have moments, um, like we don't fight, but we have moments that we discuss things and we don't agree, but every marriage will have that, but it shouldn't be where there's just a constant. Our decorating skills. Yeah. <laughs> we don't agree I'm terrible decorating. at decorating. So I just stay away from it. I'm like, honey, I want to hang a, a mirror here. No, no. Because no. I had no idea. I'll hang like those little skinny mirrors for the you door. I'll mirrors. hang it sideways. I'm like, honey, if you hang it sideways. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm terrible at decorating. So um, before we go, we have a prayer. I know. Um, oh, yeah. Playing. yeah those are kids playing so listen i hope you guys enjoy this we're going to say a prayer we're going to pray it out next week oh my goodness i always say this y'all wait till next week john chapter 16 Ooh, it's pretty good on his way to the cross it's about to get we're just a couple hours from the cross and i'm telling y'all listen before we pray i am telling you the closer we get to the cross it's about to get Y'all cannot miss the next few Bible studies because I've been waiting to close this book out of John. It's going to be incredible. So that's enough said. Next week, the same time, 6.30. Honey, close us out in prayer. You have some prayer for some people. We do. Are you going to switch it up like that? You close it out in prayer. I do. Yeah. I was just testing it. Yeah. So we're going to pray for, um, you can help me add the names if I forget. Uh, it's, it's Deb. Deb, so. And Mom Bob. So Father God, we want to thank you for this time that we don't do this in vain, that nothing we do is just for vain repetition, that we do anything to glorify ourselves. Father, in whatever way, wherever this word needs to go, your word, not my word, like Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. Father, I just ask that you advance whatever you need to happen with a seed, however long it takes, whoever it affects, that it might glorify uh, you and, and it might be seed into their life and bless their life. And Father, I just, before I go any further, I want to pray for Deborah, uh, my mom, Deborah, as well. Um, her and her husband are having some things are going through some situations, I would say, with health. Not, not major, but things are dealing with. Quick recovery. Yeah, quick recovery. Um, and the other Deborah, is that correct, honey? Deborah Cole. Deborah Cole, we pray for. Um, just lift her up. We lift her up, Father, that you. Um, Bless her that you be her rear gunner, her, or her rear gunner, her um, rear, guard. rear guard and forerunner, Father, that you would be all through her life. And this woman can cook too, by the way, Deborah Cole. Ooh. But you might just guard her and all that she's going through. And as you lift up pastors, ministers, church um, servants, leaders, Father, just lift up our tonight nation. our nation, lift up, lift up this nation. And peace for Israel. Peace for Israel. Father, just your word says that good will be called evil and evil will be called good. Father, I, I'm going to just say in Jesus' name that that hearts can be turned, nations can be brought together, that um, that your word says nations will be against nations as ethnicities against ethnicities. Father, that 
that, that there's no division, that the division that we've created, Father, that you just heal that in Jesus' holy name. And I just, I, I lift a hand up to um, Pastor Robert, Pastor James, Pastor Lisa, Miss Chrissy, I, I just, leaders that are, that are out there in the trenches that are fighting the good fight, that are, that are sacrificing um, days, you know, days and nights. And um, I just sleepless hours, Pastor Robert here in Fairfield, they have a huge ministry and a, a, a fairly, I guess you'd say a small church, but doing big ministry and affecting thousands of people with their food bank. Um, just, you know, nativity scenes and, and, and Fairfield, beautiful nativity scenes and just the love and the passion that so many people, uh, great, much greater than us, that they do for just for the cause of the ministry, Father. And I just ask you, you just put a hedge of protection over every single living being on earth tonight. And that Jesus' name be preached and be shared in the marketplace, not just, you know, locally in Judea or in Fairfield in our case or in Shreveport, but you just carry your word and you'll cover the planet with your love. And if nothing else needs to be prayed for tonight, Father, we just ask all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Okay, that's a wrap. Next week's John chapter 16. And it is going to be good. Right. I'm going to leave this one for y'all to figure out. So we'll, we'll get there. I love you guys. God loves you. We love you. Till next week. See ya.